Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! Hello, and thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. I was going to respond here to a few questions that people have sent me. Here we go. First question is, is it possible for someone who says they believe in God, but never attend church to enter the kingdom of heaven? Is it possible for someone who says they believe in God, but don't go to church, can they make it to the kingdom of heaven? Well, that's kind of a sort of trick answer. The answer is no. No, they cannot because, quote, believing in God doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus. Now, please don't pass that point too quickly because this is a very big point. In my experience, depending on the city in which I've lived and the denomination at which I worked, but it's still fairly common, some it's much more common than others, to think that believing in God is, you might say, enough Jesus never, ever, ever commanded or declared or begged or cajoled or asked for people to, quote, believe in God. The early church didn't ask or demand that people believe in God. There was a very different, very specific thing they demanded. It was full, absolute allegiance to Jesus of Nazareth absolute complete full allegiance to him putting all your faith and trust in him alone so that is i mean a nutshell what it means to be a christian i mean a nutshell we can say it different ways and I, and i will say more in just a second but remember in james 219 in the biblical book of james 219 it says demons believe in god well so what but we know that demons won't enter the kingdom of heaven we know that Jesus, uh, the, well, at least in the Greek translation, in Matthew twenty five forty one, he calls Satan and his demon, uh, Satan and his angels, and his minions will be punished. They don't make it to the kingdom of heaven; they make it to hell. It's also a similar concept in Jude six and in Revelation sixteen four. So demons believe in God, and they never ever go to church. Some do go to church. Some demons love church. I, I've been at those churches actually. But that doesn't make you a Christian, and no, the answer is no, believing God does not at all make you enter the kingdom of heaven. To make it real, here's a specific example. Now, this is all through the New Testament. I could choose tons of different verses and so forth, but I think of this one because it came to mind so quickly as a very specific, um, explicit declaration of the kinds of things Christians are known for and also things for which they're they should not be known for that is to say here's an example of something where this generic believe in god is most certainly not adequate to describe what a disciple of jesus is and it's what the apostle paul says in 1 corinthians 6 9 to 11 and i'll just use the net translation paul says in 1 corinthians 6 9 to 11 he says this do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do you not know that and a little footnote, he didn't say, do you not know that those who don't believe in God, it's the unrighteous. And when he says that in the Jewish theology, he doesn't mean just someone who has certain beliefs. He means behavior, someone who acts as if they are in a covenant relationship with God. And to prove the point, Paul is about to give a whole list of behaviors that he deems unrighteous, not their beliefs, but their behaviors. And he says, so do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Right out the gate, he says, the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, passive homosexual partners, practicing homosexuals, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, the verbally abusive, and swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. A little footnote, now surely that's not exhaustive. Paul's listing absolute standard grade A Jewish orthopraxy. That is, this is right behavior. This is nothing he has said here or some, 
Paul, this is this is novel. If you're a Jew in his time period, and if you're practicing Orthodox Jew now, this is standard belief. This flows straight out of the Old Testament uh, ethical codes. But he says these. Okay, and he says some of you once lived this way, but you were washed. Of course, that means by baptism. Uh, you were sanctified, that is made holy. You were justified, put in right relationship in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So the Spirit washed us and sanctified and justified us. And he's saying, of course, that's the way you used to be. You used to behave that way. Now you do not. What he didn't say is, you used you used to be agnostic. You used to be an atheist. Now you believe that God exists. Now you're cool. That's exactly what it doesn't say because no one thought that way. So if the, if the questioner really means... Well, David, okay, I don't just mean believe in God. What I mean is, can they be a Christian? So let's say, let's say the, if you're wondering, well, David, can a person be a disciple of Jesus? Or, or to use Paul's language, can you be sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God, and never attend church and still enter the kingdom of heaven? So if I ask the Apostle Paul, okay, Paul, you just told me all these people, the unrighteous won't inherit. What if they are righteous? What if they are justified and sanctified and never go to a church meeting? The answer has to be yes. Yes, they certainly are still Christian, but they would remain an infant Christian. This is built into the so-called, you might say, DNA of biblical Christian understanding and theology. That is, you cannot be removed from Christian community and expect to be maturing. It is impossible. God designed the church as an organism, a healthy, living, breathing, well, sometimes healthy, but it's supposed to be a healthy organism fueled by the spirit and given as its source or headship and their head probably means source of Jesus Christ himself. Well, that's how you grow. That's how we learn our skill sets, our strengths, our giftedness, how the proverb says iron sharpens iron. That's how we encourage each other and so forth. It's not a com- It's not a new problem. It's not a new problem uh, for people to stop going to church. People make every single possible excuse not to go to church these days. Well, that was pretty common in the ancient world too. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, chapter uh, ten, verses twenty-four to twenty-five, the author of Hebrews also addresses the issue of people skipping church. You might say he doesn't use that vocabulary, but that's what he's talking about. And he says this, and I'll use the NET translation once more. He says. And let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works. That's what he means. Spur, it means cajole. Uh, It's it's, it's the word they use if you poke an animal to go. To spur one another on to love and good works. Not abandoning our own meetings. It means church. As some are in the habit of doing. But encouraging each other. And even more so because you see the day drawing near. End quote. The point is, we need each other. We have to be and spur one another to do the right thing. That's the good work. Spur each other to love. Spur each other to encourage one another. That's what church is supposed to be. So can you be a Christian, a legit disciple of Jesus, and never go to a church? Of course you can. But you will stay a baby. It's like saying, can I stay alive on a deserted island? Of course you can. But you're going to be emaciated and unhealthy and psychologically unstable. But can you survive? Sure you can. But you won't be mature. You just, there's no way, there's just no way. There's just, uh, well, David, the spirit can do miraculous things. Well, sure it is. All I know is the New Testament never says that. New Testament says you need the healthy organism of the body of Christ. And two, in my own experience, every single mature Christian I've ever known in my entire life isn't a loner. Every single one of them is uh, part of a body of Christ to some varying degree. Now, of course, does that mean, David, I have to go to a church building and I have to go to some traditional service? Church buildings weren't constructed for churches, church bodies until probably at least the third century. So people meant people's homes, parks, wherever they could meet without being killed for a long time. And then eventually they started building their own buildings just for that purpose. So don't get wrapped up in buildings. Oh, Lord, buildings and suits and guitars and organs and piano. Who gives a rip? That's not a church. Those are the tools a church uses. Those are instruments to use. And I mean that metaphorically and literally. Uh, It gives us air conditioning, heating, and so forth, blocking from the rain. But that is not the church. The church, of course, is the body. But you know what I mean. So can someone never be part of a local body of Christ? Yes, they can, but they're going to stay a baby. 
So you need to find a local body of Christ and get to work. We have wonderful neighbors who are Mormons. Is Mormonism Christian? Where does it go away from orthodoxy? What do we and our neighbors share in common? That's a great question, and there's all kinds of literature, books written on this, articles written on this, whole websites devoted to this. And so I, I will just speak very briefly, and you can go read all you like. And I encourage you to, particularly, really seriously, listener, um, if you do have uh, members of the LDS, that they prefer that, the Jesus Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, LDS, Latter-day Saints, most don't prefer to be called Mormons. Um, that probably, we're not exactly sure where it comes from. It might be a corruption of the word Moroni, uh, which is the supposed angel that visited Joseph Smith. But in any case, uh, Mormon, it's not a, I'm not using it as a cuss word, but they prefer LDS people, so I'll call themselves that. If you have neighbors who are part of the LDS uh, so-called church, if you have relatives and so forth, I really do encourage you to read more. And do a lot more than my few minutes here of explanation because you want to be informed. Uh, though, though I'm going to say at the end very end, the very, very best thing is to ask them what the person believes. That way, you don't have 14 PhDs in Mormonism or LDS theology. You just need to, be able to have a good conversation. So, but I do encourage you to read more. Um, now, the answer is: Are they Christian? That's the first thing. Most Christians say no. Most Christians say that the people in the LDS are not Christian. And there are about, I don't know, four, five, six major reasons, most common reasons. Now, people in the LDS will respond to all of this, uh, the issues is whether you find it compelling or you know convincing. The, the first one is this. Here's the first major thing is you need to understand the Latter-day Saints believe that Joseph Smith was God's prophet to restore the church in 1830. I mean, he'll give you exact date. Uh, that is to say, they believe that there was a total apostasy. If you don't know what that means, apostasy means a leaving of the faith, a leaving of a religious view. Joseph Smith was a teenager who believed that an angel came to him and said, go out to this area not too far from where you live and dig up here. These golden tablets will be there. These golden tablets will be in a kind of, a particular kind of, um, well, not evolved, but higher form of uh, uh, hieroglyphics called Reformed Hieroglyphics, supposedly. And in it is a long narrative, a long saga, and two tribes had, went to war with each other and had all kinds of stuff, elephants, horses, chickens, and all kinds of stuff. He wasn't supposed to show anybody these golden tablets, and he did and got in trouble, and the angel took him away. And then later on, he begged for forgiveness. He showed him again, and so forth. But a chief fundamental belief that Joseph Smith told everybody was God revealed to him what the true gospel is and the church is really supposed to be about, and that every single other denomination in the world was wrong. Every single person who believed anything else besides what Joseph Smith taught is absolutely wrong. little footnote, it is precisely what Muhammad said. Muhammad said the exact same thing with every other religion, not just denomination, but religion in the world. If you said anything else besides there is one God and Muhammad is his prophet, it's because your religion got corrupted. Even Jesus was a Muslim. Abraham was a Muslim. Everybody was a Muslim, but they all, all of their followers screwed it up. And so Muhammad had to come fix everything. And that's why in scholarship, it is a restorationist movement. Well, the same thing was the LDS just about 1800 or 1500 years later was Joseph Smith, who said the exact same thing. Basically, certainly within the denominations of the Christian movement, he said there was a total apostasy, that everybody got it wrong, and he's there to restore it. Now, that's a big deal. So right off the bat, if you ask the question, is he Christian, you have to, the, the first major, um, not hurdle, but the first major thing you've got to come to grips with is, do you believe Joseph Smith really was God's final prophet to correct this overwhelmingly screwed up ship? that needed to be turned toward the right direction. Do you believe there's a t there was a total apostasy? Now, the Bible explicitly disallows that. It never says that everyone will turn astray after Jesus. Was there some accretions, some things that probably aren't original to the earliest primitive Christians? Yeah. Uh, as a Protestant, particularly, I really think that the Roman Catholic Church, I think Roman Catholicism historically was a baptized Roman religion. And I can argue that, and many, many books have argued that. Uh, there was no such thing as priests in the New Testament. There's no such thing. There's a lot of things that the Roman Catholicism does today that is directly mirrored off of 3rd and 4th century pagan Roman religion. 
So, but if you get rid of that stuff, I still think the gospel that the Catholic Church teaches is still gospel. I don't think they've all apostatized. But anyway, the second major point is LDS uh, people have radically different views of God. Now, if you if you came up to me and said, this is a, this is a difficult one, right? So someone says, do Muslims and Christians believe in the same God? And I've talked about this in a different podcast. You have to determine whether or not you, what's called the, well, I don't want to get bogged down in philosophy. There's an issue of identity. What characteristics of a thing have to be exactly the same for it to be the exact same? Some properties are essential. Some properties are contingent. So, for example, my wife and I are both human, but we're obviously not the same person, the same kind of human, because we have various qualities that are contingently different. But our essential properties are quite similar. We have human nature. We are soul body. We have rational souls that can feel and so forth. We and on and on. But we have a lot of contingent factors that are different, different DNA and so forth. Well, if someone comes to me and said, hey, I, re- I met your wife the other day, and I go, great. And they go, yeah, she's really tall, right? She's six foot tall with, with blonde hair. I would say, no, you haven't met my wife. They go, well, sure I have, yeah, because she's from Florida, and she loves chocolate and Hallmark movies. I go, well, that's true, but she's not six foot tall with blonde hair. You're completely wrong. She's five foot four, in fact. And they go, no, no, no. So the question is, if I'm talking to, this, if I'm talking to you and you said that, at what point do I say, you have met someone else like my wife, but not my wife? How many characteristics do I have to describe that are distinct? In that particular example, I would say you have not met my wife because that's a big deal to get the height unless you're just crazy with heights and she doesn't have blonde hair either. So that's also another factor that's weird. Well, it's like that with God. It's like that with God. And, and this is an important point. Christians don't have the exact same view of Yahweh, of God the Father, Son, and Spirit. There are Christian denominations, particularly within the Pentecostal tradition, that believe more of a Unitarian God, that God the Father, Son, and Spirit is really one person, not just one God, but one person. So when you say Jesus, you really mean God the Father and so forth. That view historically is considered a heresy. It's been heresy since the fourth century. Most Christians say you had to be Trinitarian, but you have the point is within Christianity, there are different views, Calvinist versus everybody else or reformed or whatever you want to call yourselves. The, the, the whole fundamental understanding, does God predestine people to hell? Does God sovereignly control everything or set up the stage? Every, I mean, it's a very different conception of who God is and what he does. And it's a, it seems, in my opinion, it's not always a clear answer of, well, are we still Christian siblings or not? Um, on the examples I just gave, I think we are still Christian siblings because I think the differences aren't that big of a deal. And I would make an argument for that big of a dealness <laughs> based on Scripture. But Roman Catholics are going to disagree with me because they say we don't form our big of a deal the- theological views based on Scripture. We form our theological uh, non-negotiables, you might say, based on church tradition. And so we do disagree on some of those things for sure, but you'll find a lot of agreement. But I'm just, I'm just trying to be as fair as I can that when say, well, Christians believe, that's a mouthful, though I do think there is a core and most of the three major divisions of Roman Catholicism, Orthodox, and Protestant do have very core similar beliefs that LDS does not. And so that's, I'm saying all that for my second major point, which is LDS people have very different views of God. Things like this. The LDS teaches constantly that God the Father the Father has a body of flesh and bones. Has a body. It's not. He's not a spirit. He has a body of flesh and bones. In fact, it teaches in LDS theology, quote, there was a long procession of gods and fathers leading up to our Heavenly Father. Well, that's precisely what the Old Testament and the New Testament says the exact, that is wrong. Numbers 23, 19, Hosea 11, 9, and John 4, 24, God is spirit. He's not flesh and bone. And God the Father doesn't have parents or grandparents or great, 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 grandparents. So there's no procession in the Bible. God the Father is not at all a, a dude, a human. He's not even a special creature with flesh and bones. Uh, Jews and Christians have always historically been very adamant about that point. Uh, but LDS is a very different conception of God there. Another thing is LDS believe that Jesus was born as a spirit child of a heavenly father and heavenly mother. And then Jesus progressed over a long time. He progressed up to deity in the spirit world. Then later he was physically conceived in Mary's womb. Now, all over the New Testament would disprove that. 
Jesus is never, ever, ever thought of, I mean, radically ever thought to have parents, grandparents, great grand grandparents. He, he wasn't, he's not literally God the Father's son. I think when Joseph Smith, as a teenager, I think that's what he thought God the Son meant. I think he thought Jesus, God the Son, really meant that God the Father was his daddy. And in my view, that's like saying Elaine is six foot tall with blonde hair. That is, these are deal breakers. You're, we're not talking about the same thing. So then the question is, can you still be Christian and have these kind of radically different views of God? My response is no. Okay, those are two. The last three things. The third thing is another common reason why LDS is not considered Christian by most Christians is they do not accept the creeds, the confessions, and formulations which arise from the New Testament. They totally reject the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and so forth. Now, most, well, a lot of Christians would say you don't have to believe in the so-called church council creeds to be a Christian. I mean, many Roman Catholics might and Orthodox might. Protestants certainly don't. But most, all three of those traditions would concur that to various degrees, those later creeds are crystallizations of things that come from the New Testament. I mean, and you can prove that easily because if you look at the vocabulary of the creed, say the Apostles, Nicene Creed, most of the creeds are direct quotes from the New Testament. They're direct quotes. And there's enormous amount of literature. My PhD is in this field. Uh, and I don't know, you just trust me or don't trust me, whatever. But this, it's easy to see that. There are things in the creeds with which I disagree, and Protestants do disagree, and other people disagree. And that's why the, the creeds had it kept being written. But when they were written, in that snapshot, in that Polaroid snapshot of the changing flow river of theology, at the time, it was the best way to articulate their understanding of God. And I don't fault them for that. It's just that over time, we realize that's just probably not the best way to say it And over time. But anyway, now what's important here is the New Testament itself repeatedly exhorts Christians to reject any teaching that deviates what the apostles taught. This is all through the New Testament. Stay to what the apostles taught. Stay to what the apostles taught. Now, this reminds me of the first critique, which is Joseph Smith being this so-called prophet, and everyone's wrong. Church in the late antiquity, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries particularly, are much more reliable historically to represent the New Testament teaching than anything Joseph Smith says. That's my view. The fourth thing is Latter-day Saints don't believe that faith in Jesus is enough. They do believe in more of a, you got to work for it. There are various temple rituals like baptisms and marriage sealings, uh, which means there's a degree to which they do deny that Christ's death, uh, his atonement was sufficient. It wasn't sufficient. You've got to work for it as well. That is fundamentally against Christian theology. And if you're a Protestant, most Protestants are taught that Roman Catholics believe in a works righteousness, and that is false individual Catholic thinkers might, but in Catholic theology, that is false. And Catholic theology very much argues uh, for grace, God's grace given through Jesus himself. Absolutely. And it is only they believe it's through grace. They just believe that if you have God's grace and you are a Christian, you will have good works to demonstrate it and prove it. And that's overwhelmingly biblical. The book of James says that explicitly, that you have to have that. But anyway, so Christians believe that that grace and faith and salvation is a gift. Now, we have belief, but the, we receive it as a gift. That is not what LDS believes. And that's a big distinction in Christian theology. And, of course, the last thing, not of importance, but the last thing I'll mention is, of course, LDS does not believe that even the minimum of 66 books of the canon of the Bible is enough. You also have to add the so-called Book of Mormon, uh, the book called The Doctrine and Covenants, and also the, the story called The Pearl of Great Price. These are sacred texts. Now, some might come back to that and say, yeah, David, but you have the Protestant canon of 66 books, but Roman Catholics and Orthodox and like Ethiopian Christians, they've got, I think it's 80-something, so they've got a lot more books they consider sacred. The answer is, you're right. That's true. It is true that these other Christian denominations that I consider to be Christians consider other texts to be sacred. The distinction is... And the research I've done, none of these other sacred texts differ radically from what I consider to be the Old New Testament. They do not introduce radically new theology 
about God and his God's character and his history and so forth. And that's, anyway, they don't. And because of that, I can still consider a person a Christian. But these, and the LDS, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, these things do represent radically different changes to what is represented in the Bible, and therefore I reject that. So most Christians do say no. If is a Mormon Christian, most would say no. So let me say it this way, and this is wordy, but this is the way I say it. <laughs> because people have asked me this in person as well, and I say this. I've said this to Mormons before. They don't, I've said this to people at LDS. It doesn't necessarily make them happy when I say it, but because... But nevertheless, I very much, very much believe it. I say it this way. If you define Christianity by typical, orthodox, historical criteria, the answer is no. It goes away from historic orthodoxy on many points. And I just listed several of them. Yet, we do share many things in common. LDS can talk about grace and truth and Jesus and death and resurrection. Absolutely they can. It's just that in the LDS, they just differ from me on some non-negotiable things that just take it way too far. So the key is, always ask the person in front of you what he or she believes. Always. That's anything, by the way. Atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Muslim, whatever. Try not to give them a label right away. Try not to... to, What you believe is, and you believe, don't tell people what they believe. It's going to put them in a defensive stance immediately. And they do it to you, too. So when they say, well, you believe as a Christian, whether they talk like that, you, you, you. <laughs> if you, if you meet someone who talks like that, you believe, you, 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 you got to send it to me. Send, I will put it on the air on my podcast and say, see, there's one person in the world who talks like that, you. Uh, anyway, so if they say that to you, that's what you Christians believe, as that happens to me often when I talk to non-believers, I actually, I smile and I say, well, actually I don't. And Feel free to ask me what I believe. I'll be happy to tell you what I believe versus you assuming what I believe. And I'll do the same with you. Is that okay? And that's how we have good, healthy conversations. Well, then, David, why read about the LDS church at all? Because it informs you. It informs you. A lot of people in their religious movements don't have a clue what their religions actually teach. Same thing with Christianity. Christians and a lot of Christians don't have a daggum clue what Christianity teaches. And any tradition, any denomination, any movement. And so, it, I mean, it works everywhere. But it's real good to go to the, if you have neighbors or you want to be more informed, read the LDS, I think it's LDS.org. Go to their main website. You can read exactly what it is they believe and be more informed. You can watch their videos and so forth. Um, that will help you be informed when you talk to your neighbor to say, you give him more background. But you do want to talk to the person. They said, we believe in Jesus too. You go, great. Can you tell me more about Jesus? What do you believe about Jesus? Well, we believe in God too. Good. Tell me more. What do you believe about God? They're going to use the same vocabulary words, but when you start describing it and defining it, it's going to come out very different. Uh, say, where did you, do you believe Jesus came from somewhere? Where did Jesus come from? Uh, do I have to earn salvation? Do I have to do extra more? Is Jesus enough? Those kinds of questions. Uh, what do you believe about Christian movements after the New Testament? Are they Have they all gone wrong? Are they all screwed up and we need Joseph Smith to get right on track? Those kinds of things. So just ask them. And you get to determine what you find convincing. Um, and ideally, if you have a good conversation, you build a relationship. And then they ask you, why do you believe what you believe? And then you have a great dialogue. That's wonderful. And if you don't know, it's, ah, it's a good question. I'll get back to you. And you go, you believe. That's <laughs> At the very end of every conversation, just say, well, see you later. Uh, all right. Well, I'm being silly. God bless you. And I'll keep answering the questions. See you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you'll listen more. If you want more, go to davidpendergrass.com. There are tabs at the top that let you have access to all the podcasts I've recorded, to sermons I've done, uh, books I've written. They're all there at davidpendergrass.com. You can also check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom. And also look at my Twitter feed at glimpse the king or at Dr. D. Pendergrass, at Dr. D. Pendergrass. There are tons of ways reached out. I hope you will. Send me your questions. Send me your comments. If you'd like to support the ministries of Glimpse of the Kingdom, you can also find ways to give online on davidpendergrass.com. If you'd like for me to come and do some consulting, check out my website, davidpendergrassconsulting.com, and I'll be happy to come out and speak to your organization and help and train any way I can. God bless you. See you online.